He had his apostles gathered about him one day, and he said to them, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. But the peace which God gives is a gift which exists even in suffering, in one, or even in time of war. I covered the war in Iraq. I've been to Afghanistan. I covered Hurricane Katrina. I've seen it all. But the most memorable moments of my life have been because of this story. It's the most incredible story that, that I ever got to work on. When you try to unravel the story of how that happened, you cannot get to that story without learning about the contribution of William Hansen. William Hansen lived in New York City, and when he retired, he went to live in Naples, Florida. He's got nightmares, PTSD, he's got health problems. So he went to his doctor, when he was with his doctor, the doctor asked him if he'd been in the military. So he told them that not only was he in the military, but he was in a POW camp for three years. So this doctor told him that he should go to the Veterans Administration. So he went to the VA. And as he's in the waiting room, um, he sees this magazine, and it's Columbia magazine, and there's an article about Father Capon in it. And he looks at the pictures, and he's like, you know, this is Korea. He read the story that in, the, in the magazine that there was this Father Hatsi who was investigating Father for Sainthood. It reminded him. Well, this is the priest that I knew. This is the priest who helped me. Hansen sees this magazine, and he uh, he takes it into the, the doctor's office, and he says, hey, I buried this guy. And the doctor said, so why aren't you telling him about that? They're investigating his life. So he calls Hotsey, contacts Hotsey, and they have a conversation. And Hotsey was intrigued enough and realized that, that the story that Hansen told was, was really valuable, and not only to the church, it was valuable to the Pentagon, which was trying to figure out how to find him, along with other soldiers from the Korean War. Father Capon had a, a unique reputation amongst chaplains. He was known as a tough guy. Father would go to the sound of the guns. He would pray with them, or he'd administer the last rites to them. He would hold their hands as they're dying. Whatever they were going through, he went through too. They had utter respect for him, you know, as a soldier, but also as a priest. Someone who would go miles and miles and miles to the soldiers in the most remote you know, villages and outposts to ensure that they receive the, the sacraments. So they were one of the first units uh, that was sent to the Korean Peninsula after the North Koreans invaded. His unit was often under attack, and so soldiers would get hit in these battles, and everybody's retreating because there's like thousands of North Koreans coming at us. He would run straight toward the enemy lines, grab these guys with the uh, bullets kicking up dust around his feet, and he would drag them back and bring them to safety. And there went that priest running across the battlefield, headed for the sound of the guns. And they said, Father, why do you do that? He said, where do you hear all that shelling? Where do you hear that gunfire? Someone is wounded. Someone is dying. They need me.
by most accounts, it was probably about 10,000 to 20,000 Chinese versus maybe 600 Americans. The men tell him, they look at him and say, Father, you've got to try and make it out of here. Try and get to safety. And he says, no, my place is here with the wounded. They're encircled by the Chinese on all sides. And Kapan is one of the, the soldiers trapped in this pocket. And Father literally walked right up to the Chinese and held up his hands and said, just stop. Let us surrender here. You don't have to shoot these people. There's 20 or so guys uh, saved because of him. And as these captives are being led off by the Chinese, Kapan notices that a Chinese soldier nearby is preparing to shoot and kill a wounded American lying on the ground. That wounded American is Herbert Miller. And that soldier pointed his rifle right at Herb's forehead. Kapan crosses the road, shoves the Chinese soldier out of the way, and picks up Sergeant Miller. Herb said, now I knew he was going to kill us both. And he said, I waited for the sound of the gun. And why he didn't turn his rifle onto Father Capon to this day, no one knows. He said the soldier had such a shocked look on his face. He couldn't believe this man was not afraid to die. Well, the conditions in the prisoner war camp uh, would have been abysmal. The winter was the coldest winter that they had had on record, and temperatures dropped down to negative 20, negative 30. Frostbite and crude amputations and uh, sicknesses of all kinds and pneumonia, dysentery. You know, they were starving in the camp. They were skeletons. We were living on uh, cracked corn and millet, what millet, which is bird seed. Men are starving to death. And other men, particularly young men, lose hope and give up. Many of the survivors attributed their survival to the encouragement they received from Father Capon. Father gave those men everything in that prison camp. And reminding them that Christ didn't abandon them on the cross and he wasn't going to abandon them in this prisoner of war camp. He gave them a will to live and uh, taught them to keep their faith and their God and their country. At night, he would sneak around and sneak under the wire. Beyond sight of the enemy to find potatoes or whatever he could find and bring them back, not for himself, but to share. He would come in and they said he would put his hand on their shoulder and say, Joe, did you eat anything today? Did you get a drink of water? And in these little visits, of course, he would end them with a prayer and, uh, or in some cases, even a rosary. That really kept the spirit up in the camp. He would always say, resist what they're trying to tell you. Don't forget who you are and what, what our values are. Unfortunately, Kapan falls ill, and the Chinese see their chance to eliminate a leader of the ideological resistance. The Chinese send a squad to take Kapan to the hospital. The hospital at Pyaktong is, in fact, a place where prisoners are left to die. I was there, uh, I gotta admit, uh, tears running down my face, and. Uh, he said, uh, uh, Mike, don't, don't cry. I'm going where I always wanted to go. And when I get there, I'll be saying a prayer for all of you. That, uh, it's hard, hard to really go back to that. Father Capon was taken away. He was taken to this death house. Three days later, he dies. And as far as the senior officers are concerned, his body would have been disposed of just like all of the rest of the soldiers who had died at that point, which was tossed onto one of these piles or into this mass grave. In the early 2000s, I got a call from William Hansen. 
and he told me that he buried Father Capon. I thought, this can't, can't be true. For 40 years, 50 years, we had heard that he had been buried in one of these mass graves. He told me that he was with Father Capon when he was in the death house where Father Capon died. And he said that he was assigned to go out and to bury him. This Chinese guard comes up and says, come with me, grabs a couple of other soldiers. Uh, you need to bury this body. So Hanson goes out, and so these three Americans carry him off and look around, and nobody's watching over us. So they, with their hands and sticks and pieces of wood, they dig in the ground. They said they got down a foot and a half, placed Father in the grave, and it was not deep enough. They covered him best they could with dirt, and then they put rocks over the top of him. So after they covered Father Capon's body with the rocks to protect him, uh, they said a prayer over him and left and really never knew what happened to him. Well, now we understand that when the war was over, both sides exchanged remains. And uh, as it turns out, uh, the, when the communists were repurposing the town, uh, they must have come across this pile of rocks, realized that it was a body, and, and sent it back. That's how um, he actually, his remains were actually sent home to Hawaii and buried with other unknowns uh, from the Korean War. That was the first we'd ever heard that Father Capon was not buried in one of these mass graves. Well, at the time, there was a man named Phil O'Brien uh, who worked for the Department of Defense. And it was his job to try to identify everybody that had been in Camp Number 5. When I talked to Phil O'Brien about it, he said, you know, he said, all of this rings true. In fact, Hansen told a credible story. He had been there the time vouched for it, May. The location vouched for it, the sick house. His presence vouched for it. That was Phil O'Brien that said, you know, that there's a good chance that Father Capon's remains are already here in the United States. And eventually, after the DNA sorted itself out, we had not only a height match, age match, dental match, circumstantial match, clavicle match, but a solid hit mitochondrial DNA match, and I believe a Y chromosome match to boot. We did it. The apostles, they didn't have a catechism when they started to go out to preach the good news to the whole world. What did they do? They went out and told stories about this man, Jesus, who had touched their lives. That's the power you know, of storytelling and evangelization. The history of, of the Columbia Magazine, I mean, it stretches as far as almost since the beginning of the order. And it was seen as a way for this organization of Catholic men, of the Knights of Columbus, to be united through the written word. Providential, probably, right? Um, uh, that, that this gentleman saw the magazine, was inspired enough to pick it up and to read the story. I know when I called Father Hatsi, and, and told him. I said, you know, you're not gonna believe what I'm gonna tell you. And, and told him that I just got the call from the army and his remains were identified. And the first thing he said, he goes, it was all true. It was all true. And it was like, yeah, he was right. 